Welcome to the Kennedy Events Podcast, where we feature top marketing, communications, and future of work leaders and share their biggest takeaways and insights. We love these conversations and hope you will too. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the Kennedy Events Podcast. I'm your host, Paige Buck. Past guests include Kim Alpert of Udemy, Sara Razavi of Working Solutions, and Elaine Honig of Studio 440. And today's episode is brought to you by Kennedy Events. We create stress-free conferences and events, providing expert management and design for all your corporate event needs, from in-person to hybrid and virtual. You can learn more about us at kennedyevents.com. And today, I'm delighted to be with David Ferris, uh, a creative professional with an extensive skill set that includes project management, technical production, event planning, visual art, and graphic design. He has excellent communication, focus, and multitasking ability, and excels in creating dynamic environments for client events. As head of live events at EPMC, David is focused on creating opportunities that draw, drive long-term event and business sustainability for both company and clients. Dave, welcome. Hello, hello. Hey, thank you for having me. Super happy to have you here. Um, so I was digging in a little bit on in your background before we got uh, started, but I would love to hear, how did you come into this broader events world and into technical production in particular? Uh, very good question. I um, kind of go winding path to get here, maybe a bit different than some others, but um, uh, all the way back to uh, I used to, used to DJ and started a portable DJ service in high school, and so that was like the beginnings of you know liking to throw a party in, in, in essence. And then um, in college, um. I majored in inter arts and technology, which is using uh, technology and art, um, and worked a lot in the theater and dance program there. And so that got some experience uh, working in theater and getting light, stage lighting and things like that. I've always loved photography, so that lent itself to kind of framing and light and graphic design as well. Um, and so I always did production on, as kind of a, a side hustle. Uh, and I had a ran a nonprofit. Uh, art and conservation project working with elephants actually um and so that kind of lent itself to contract negotiation and, and uh, you know, customer um you know working with customers and organizing events on a more corporate angle um, yeah. and then um yeah moved to san francisco and and started uh, in full time uh, doing doing production work and kind of Quickly rose the ladder and um, uh, became senior senior production manager at the last company, and then uh, broke off on my own. Um, and yeah, so just kind of meandering way there, but it wasn't necessarily uh, you know, coming from a hotel corporate ballroom or anything like that. You know, it's funny that it feels like meandering and uncommon to you, but it feels like a, a really obvious path to me because I was a theater major also. So. <laughs> <laughs> you get it, yeah. But, and 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 theater is like even more, I guess, vague than your really specific inter arts degree, which is fascinating. <laughs> um, I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I the the last time I I still have my um wrench with the black line on it that I used like for being up in the grid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it had to always be tied to yourself so that the wrench could not fall on someone's head. But valuable lessons learned. And valuable lessons learned. And I, I like refuse to take the black line off of it just because <laughs> like, a, yeah, the memento of those days. Oh, I love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but your the path that I thought was really interesting was the conservation and elephant nonprofit that you ran. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, so, uh, worked with and, and managed, a, we used to teach elephants how to paint um, and then market and sell the paintings to raise money to help the elephant. So essentially, elephants helping themselves as artists. They paint an hour a day, and we have gallery and museum exhibitions, and all those funds goes to provide them with proper veterinary care and things like that. How did, did you create this nonprofit? It was started by two, two Russian artists um, in 1990 as a kind of a conceptual art project, and then I took over and uh, kind of built it into a 
proper functioning nonprofit organization. So we worked with and helped elephants all over Southeast Asia. Yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. I'm going to have to put, you're going to have to show me that artwork. I think it's beautiful. Maybe we can share some of it uh, in this post. But um, I also love that. It sounds like it's like your nonprofit business background that taught you all of the like the business essentials to mm. the like, oh, I can absolutely run this thing by myself. Yeah, definitely. So I've always kind of built my own path versus uh, working for a, a very corporate structured company or something like that. So mm-hmm. um, there was a lot of you know, figuring it out as you go and, you, you know. If you don't know how to do something, you, you read up and learn how to do it. And I think that lends itself as well to event corporate world. Um, you know, each each event is unique. And it's like, oh, what, what does this cost? And you're like, well, it depends on the venue, depends on the circumstance, depends on the timeline. So there's a lot of kind of working through the details to figure out how to execute something. Well, it sounds like some of the qualities that are important are like being that like uh, resourcefulness and also like, mm-hmm. it's all figure outable. Like, I don't know, but I'm not scared that I don't know. I'm going to be able to figure it out. 100%. 100%. And, that uh, must have been really true for you in that, like, you know, the moment we feel like is now long behind us. But um, the COVID moment of like, how are we going to do this when we can't do anything we normally do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, in that regard, we, you know, we there was that moment, I think, with everyone was kind of sitting on their hands and it was like, okay, nothing's open. There's nothing we can do, um, which held true. But then I felt like at some point there was a moment where it was time to, to make some moves. And, you you know, if if you were going to come out ahead or it was a time to teach yourself something new or lean and, you know, yeah. lean into something and you could you could make some moves to come out the other end in a better place rather than sitting and waiting for the world to go back to how it was. And uh, for us, we had a lot of experience doing uh, broadcast and live streaming with, with the e-sport business that we, the tournaments that we had did, had done pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when COVID happened, everything went virtual and live stream. And so we kind of had a leg up in that regard. And so I think that really helped us get through those you know, rough few years is that we were a bit ahead of the curve and everyone trying to figure out how to stream and how to make things look good virtually and everything like that. So, yeah. And just being able to express that probably from the esports background, being able to bring that to the corporate client and say, this is doable. We can figure this out. This is what it could look like. Right. Yeah. And so that, yeah, a lot of that was like, you know, cutting things like a broadcast newscast or like ESPN does with graphics and things like this. It's not, you know, it's like, oh, we just want to do a Zoom call. I'm like, it could be so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, your team were essential to helping us shift and expand in that mm. moment. Like we were like, pretty sure we can figure this out. Pretty sure we can make virtual happen and be a resource, but each project's going to require something a little different. And then being able to express what that looked like you guys were able to say, oh, here's what the back end right. could look like. That's better than a Zoom. That's better than a Zoom meeting. <laughs> or if it is a Zoom meeting, it doesn't feel like one of those Zoom meetings with no safety net. Like, you know, 100%. who knows yeah. whether that thing is going to display on screen? Who knows whether people are going to start popping off mute in a way that <laughs> yeah, exactly. makes everybody really uncomfortable, where you're just like, but, you know, like uh, gritting your teeth the whole time. Right. And what's yeah. fascinating about that is that it became, our, our role became almost more of an IT um, situation, um, providing IT support to the remote presenters or things like that versus, you know, building lights and building a stage and screens and things like that. So it definitely evolved as far as what the expertise or what the necessary skill set and a lot of the crew was required as well. So mm-hmm. it's an adaptation that needed to happen for sure. Well, I mean, so... That kind of goes back to some of the kind of keywords in your bio, like communications is a big piece of this. Um, We and you have to be able to talk to, you know, um, people at every level in the business and express things to them in a moment when they might be nervous or uncomfortable about to take the stage for the first time and have they rehearsed and what is this confidence monitor and how do I look at it and um, I'm sure those were some of the skills you guys had to draw on in that moment to 
explain. Yeah, 100%. That and, yeah. and then it's that much more difficult when you're not in person and you can't, you know, you can't see somebody. A lot of times we're just, we'd just be in, the, in their ear, you know, they couldn't actually see us. But mm-hmm. um, I think in general, it's a particular skill set that, um, you know, to, to provide reassurance and to the client and have them feel comfortable and that they're taken care of um, while navigating the, the technical aspects that need that are required to execute this. A lot of times can be you know, very complicated and as much as you plan. And a lot of what we try to do is minimize the number of things that can go wrong. But mm-hmm. you know, nevertheless, there's always some, some unforeseen obstacle that needs to be overcome. But so it's navigating those th- two things. And I think that some people have an amazing technical mind and can um, dive into any new piece of equipment and build a computer from scratch and these things. But then be also, I, not that I can do that, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, navigating that world while actually, you know, uh, having client facing with, you know, sea uh, level execs and things like that. And there's kind of like, Two different realms and worlds kind of being bounced there. Do you find you have t- do you have teams where you have um, uh, people on your team who are great at, at bridging that divide, and then folks who fall into one or the other bucket, and then they sort of like have to I don't know form a web and support one another. Absolutely, hundred percent. So one hundred percent a team effort and all this. Um, and a lot of the guys on our team uh, can do things that I couldn't even begin to understand. And so I definitely rely and, and lean heavily on, on those individuals. Um, and so that's, you know, be, being a, a producer or production manager is is managing, you know, which was never something I, you know, uh, aimed to, aim to strive for. But it's a skill and a talent set that I've found or developed over the years. And it really is managing the crew, it's managing the timeline, it's managing the budget, managing the client. And you, you know, you need to be aware of all these things. Yeah, yeah. So you have this whole big line of business uh, in esports. And I imagine both uh, that our audience and I are probably in a, uh, a similar state of like relative ignorance about what those events look like. Mm-hmm. Can you... Kind of paint a picture of what takes place at these events and what your role is in in making them happen and making them shine. Um, yeah, of course. Like, um, using the uh, most recent event that we did was for ESL Gaming, which is a large uh, gaming entity, and they produce uh, game titles and things like this. And they had a large uh, booth stage presence at PAX West, and PAX is a uh, convention that they do around the U.S. Uh, three times a year, and um, and so it's in a lot of ways it's like a, a sporting event in that they present a game title and pro players will come and compete for a, a cash award, uh, mm-hmm. and and it, the competition can get very very intense and very escalated. This, this is very real for a lot of people and there's global events, you know, going on all over. Um, it's big business. It's, there's a lot of funds behind it, even though it's not always visible to, you know, a large percentage of the, the population, I feel like. Um, it's like a niche sport. If you're really into rugby, then you know everything about rugby. But if you're not really into gaming, you have like zero, right. zero insight into what that experience looks like. Right. So when they're okay. when they're competing, are, is there also a lot of like of spectating of the competing, both like live and online? Absolutely. So in this tournament kind of layout, so we build out. We have a stage, usually large LED walls. Uh, the players are, are competing each other against each other on stage. Where we have that up on the screen for the in-room audience, and then there's also a very large uh, remote uh, virtual audience watching on Twitch or something like that. And it can be, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the millions of, or hundreds of thousands of viewership. So, um, you know, and just in like uh, pro sports, a lot of them are sponsored, and they, you know. So it's sponsored events and there's a lot of money uh, 
going around in, in terms of supporting this process and there's fans and you know they follow each individual player and things like that so it's a, a very real it's amazing once you kind of scratch the dirt surface because i uh, admittedly early on i i was not a not a big gamer myself um and so it's been a, a learning process in that regard mm -hmm. wow and so it, it sounds like um there's a lot of like creativity and innovation in these too, because of like the, I don't know, the intensity of like the, or the immersive visual experience for the, for the spectate, for the attendees of this mm -hmm. event. Um, what, how does that compare with some of the corporate stuff you and I do? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, there's some similarities. Um, the 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 speed and energy of of the esports is a is a bit heightened i believe um and a lot of you know there's there's some cor corporate structure behind it but a lot of these companies are trend towards the younger end so there's a bit more uh, thinking outside of the box so they can take some chances or a bit it's a bit more edgy than we often get with some corporate clients um that being said there are some some corporate clients that like to push the envelope and everybody wants to kind of outdo each other as far as uh, going bigger and you know bigger and more more kind of creative and wild but um in like the bigger creative wild like wh what's fun for you like what's like a can you give me some examples of like i god i'm thinking back to a pre-covid project we did together where we did a just a beautiful ginormous curved led wall but that's like scratching the surface uh for you i know so and i know that wall can be like a circle where you're brought you know right you're displaying inside it or outside it or you know that there's just so many possibilities like can you can you paint a picture for yeah absolutely and that, that's that's where the creativity and the, the fun part comes in um and i've I believe one of the kind of important services we can provide is is helping someone visualize it. Um, you know, often meetings will start with a, with a mood board or inspiration or some, you know, some nugget or we'll pull from the website, you know, what their kind of theme and colors or what you know, the what they're going for and then run with that. Um, and then in terms of building out a stage, um, you know, there's some certain fundamentals you need. You need a projection surface, whether it's an LED wall or a projection screen, but um, otherwise kind of the sky's the limit as far as shape and size and scale. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and with projection, you know, we can we can map different surfaces and the outside of a building and things like this. So you can really kind of expand and go from there. Um, and then LED walls uh, kind of also provide <clears throat> clarity and brightness and you can do it in, outside, inside. And the sky's the limit with how big you can go and what kind of ratios you can choose and things like that. Um, you can even do LED floors and, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of, that's where the fun comes in is it, it pushing these boundaries, providing clients with some options and then having that kind of back and forth and discussion. Uh, it's it's the, the fun part of that process for me. I like that when, I mean, we get a lot of energy from when our clients are asking us, like, I don't know, what should it be? How could it be? Instead of, we just need X. Can you make X happen? Which is mm -hmm. constraining. Um, what do you wish, uh, I guess, like a new client coming in, what what do you um, wish they knew about like getting the best out of you or getting the best out of the experience of, of producing the event? Um. Yeah, you know, some clients have a very clear, concise idea of what they want, um, and that can be can be nice in terms of they have a, some understanding of what it takes to execute something. Um, but that can also be uh, limiting as far as like this: this is what we know, this is how we want it done, uh, versus thinking a little more creatively. Or there's some new technology that came out there, or something that's really helps us kind of advance that. Um, so it's not, I think having a client that's open and, and willing to, to have those conversations, those creative conversations, um, you know, having the runway to have that creative development rather, rather than, you know, oh, our shows in three weeks, like, can we, like make this happen. And then, you know, 
there's the time, time component. We, yeah, there's the time component we wish they knew. What's an ideal, like a uh, minimum for you? You know, like you feel comfortable when you have at least how many, how much time? Uh, it depends on the the size of the event. Yeah, um, sure. What, well, one of these larger, one of these larger esports engagements where you know there's going to be a lot of like refining and idea generation. Yeah, probably three so, months. Like, three months. Yeah, oh, well, it's that's really not. Quick, yeah, it yeah, yeah. Um, that's even I'm I'm pleasantly surprised because that three months for us because we're like we're earlier in the in the process and all of the planning uh, is like is coming up on a minimum. As opposed to uh, like a comfort zone, mm-hmm. um, but uh, that's that's good to hear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, can I amount that? Yeah, exactly, I, exactly. I want six. I want six. It's doable. I'm not saying that. Doable. It's doable. <laughs> where do you were just talking about new tech and new, you know, so many new things coming on the market? Where do you go to stay on top of trends or, you know, discover new tech? Although I'm sure people are, you know, sending you these things all the time, but. Um, yeah, I don't have any one particular resource. Um, just kind of just having being in the industry and having a finger on the pulse a bit. Um, yeah, you know the, the the network and the community that we built up with, with the crew and the team. Um, you know, a lot of it just kind of feeding on experiences, or somebody heard about this, or read about this, or is researching or testing this, and you know, so. Um, there's a lot of creative individuals within the industry, which is great. Nice. So it sounds like your crew are bringing you things. Have you seen this thing? We could do this with it. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of times, to be honest. Nice. Nice. That's amazing. What do you, um, are there, are there events that you or they attend to like to unpack that stuff? Or are they just always out there online, keeping their eye on it or uncovering it when they are at another event they're, they're running? Um, I, there's, uh, I was there, there's conferences and things like that. Um, I tend not to, to attend those per se, but, um, yeah. usually too busy. <laughs> yeah. Ditto. Ditto. Which is why I'm always like, wow. When, when people do have that, I'm like, really tell me more. How yeah, did you, exactly. and why do those events happen during our industry's busiest times? too? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep, I went to one in Vegas in October, like right smack between two other big projects. And the entire time I was there, I was like, why am I here? Why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> and you're so, up in your hotel room. You know. Yep, yep. Or like like leaning up against a wall in the convention center, just like, don't mind me. Yeah. Yep. Um, are there trends that you see kind of um, on the horizon or places you wish the work would go that would make it more, you know, exciting for you or your clients? Um, I think, uh, a, a lot of it's kind of behind the, the curtain advances that are, are making things, uh, easier or making old tech obsolete, you know, that doesn't necessarily, uh, you see visually per se, but um, yeah. LED like LED walls alone, you know, were a big advancement, and the resolutions getting better and better, and, and flexibility in that. Um, a lot of camera systems as well uh, are are coming down from these big bulky broadcast cameras and getting much more more flexible and integrating into uh, the new world uh, much easier. Mm-hmm. Um, Lighting is is also you know, LED versus uh, conventional lighting allows a lot more flexibility and wireless DMX, and you don't have to have plugs and cables and things running everywhere, and you can control everything. Um, so I think you know those general trends they've been kind of at play for the last 10, 10 plus years, but um, uh, yeah, I mean I, I don't have any like. Are there? I like when you were just describing like the the behind the scenes things that that people don't like that, um, but but the audience doesn't see like the direct effect, but you see what it allows you to Mm. build and and uh and create that's more like lavish or lush or at at maybe a different price point. Or, Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there's 
uh, we were talking a little bit about, and I'm, I'm curious about the actual, like, um, either the broadcast studio or like the tech table experience and how that's changed or changing and evolving. Um, we're all still on like, you know, Clearcom headsets. Um, but there's wireless for that, or we're using, you know, at some point during virtual events, we were using Discord for, in lieu of, you know, all being on like a cell phone call together. Yeah. And then we'll um, text yeah. Yeah. That's true too. That, that's other advancements as well. Um, I say advancements, but then you're, <laughs> you're on email and Slack and Discord and here, and it's like too uh, many, too many. A little much sometimes, but, um, yeah, I mean, Discord's been great. We we uh, used that quite a bit during uh, pandemic days and a lot of the virtual broadcasts. Uh, VMix is uh, a broadcast video uh, program that also has kind of transformed the that that table as well, if you will. Uh, yeah. um, besides so yeah, the, the besides like the virtual broadcast uh, studio creating that that new line of business, uh, you know, just rethinking something you were already doing to apply it to when we were all stuck at home. Um, are there ways in which the, the pandemic or remote work have, um, shifted the way you do live events or the type of events you are getting asked to do? Hmm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we still do some, some remote live events, um, but generally everything's now gone hybrid. So there'll be uh, in room audience, but also an element that is uh, a streaming element that has definitely become more common. And I think uh, a lot of clients have, if it was there, it was always an afterthought. And I think people have kind of become more aware of how important it is and what that reaches. If you have 100, pe 100 people in the room or 5,000 people in the room, you can reach 50,000, you know, uh, streaming and things like that. And then it's, it's also, it, that, I think that's the aspect that has changed a bit in this, especially in the corporate environment. What, this is something I think we are, we, um, I don't want to say struggle. We are pressed to articulate to corporate clients that there's, that a hybrid event is like, two or almost like two and a half events, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, logistics cost, you know, and, um, all of the, um, and technology wise, um, to not underestimate like, oh, it's not just one event with a stream because then you, then you risk that, that oft afterthought experience where the remote folks are, uh, like, well, that wasn't worth my time. Um, you know, or all I am is keenly aware that I'm not there. And if I were there, the experience would be good, but it's not good from here. Yeah, um, no, legitimate. And I have, have that exact conversation with clients quite a bit. As far yeah, as yeah. What are some of the ways you through. you help, like the technology can help the um, live stream audience feel engaged? You know, it's not the same, but that you can develop a, a different and still special experience for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th that is one of the obstacles and hurdles as far as how to how to cut the show and how to engage that audience. Um, and and it is innately kind of a problem to be solved. Of how do you you know if they're not in the room? So we've brought you know we've brought the, the Zoom attendees up on the in room screens and things. So there's some interaction. We brought you know. Uh, with a bit of routing magic, make it so in room and virtual can talk to each other, and you know, a lot of times it's it can be as simple as just taking chat questions and relaying those to the presenter. It's yep, the most basic form of of involving the remote participants, but a lot of times people uh, want to explore ways to to not have them be invisible and have them kind of be more participants. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have holograms of everyone in the room yet, but you know, no, we're not, we're not quite there. I, I've seen like, um, like staff dedicated to engaging that live stream audience mm -hmm. in in the chat. We've, uh, we've played around with different techniques for having like presenters or MCs that are just engaging with them. Like when there's a live moment that you really have to be live for, then are we giving the 
streaming audience a different experience where they're they're watching or interacting with somebody just in that in that space. But it takes more resources. It takes more resources. And I think that as you mentioned, rather than it just being a stream and that them not feeling part of it, um in an ideal world it is two different feeds or streams. The one's one's being cut for the screens that's going into the room and the other is a different cut that's going to the stream and uh, activates the program more than someone just sitting there. Because if you know someone's not on stage it's the, like you're watching C SPAN. Like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sitting and looking at an empty room, like how do yeah. we you know. Yes. Yes. They've just cut the mics and you're watching everybody get up and, and get water. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Going now, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, as well. Uh, and and then I would say like those that takes resources and planning and scripting and consideration. And mm-hmm. then you guys have the pressure of that. I don't know what I would think of as basically like merging two experiences into one technologically, which is. Yeah, also and so sure the experience we've been doing it for a good good amount of years now. So it's it's not a daunting task by any means, but it does take some additional thought. Any any time I ever am am like back at the table with you and your team, and I am impressed that if something is going slightly awry, as it does, speaker is late. Uh, speaker has turned off their own mic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, whatever it may be, yeah. there's been a, there's been a slide change, and uh, you know we're not displaying what we want to display. That both your your team are like heads down, intensely focused. But nobody's freaking out. There's definitely that like duck that's calm on the surface. Mm-hmm. How do you um, how do you like discover those qualities when you're when you're bringing on when you're bringing on new crew? Um, how do you pressure test them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's it is a valid problem. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, on a personal level. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but um, you know, a lot of my work is done in the, in the pre-production aspect and trying to you know, minimize the number of things that can go wrong during show and, and plan for it and have you know a fallback and have redundancy built into it. Um, and so we'll you know, always have a backup and always have these things. Whereas if something goes wrong and then everyone's looking at each other and you're like, okay, you know. And so a lot of the, the systems that we built are prepare prepare our team for that. Um, and then on, on site to try to establish kind of a, a hierarchy. Um, and so it's not everyone just yelling at each other. Everyone knows their position and their role. Um, if there's a problem, you go to here and go here, and then it'll get handled in the appropriate fashion. Um, and the ties into with with making sure that the client feels that they're taken care of and it's not, you know, the ship is on fire. It's like everything is fine and it will get handled. Um, because even though try to minimize the number of things going go that go wrong, uh there are always, you know, uncertainties that can happen and, and things you don't plan for or curveballs that come your way. So it's kind of inevitable. Um and it's try it's, it's in the pre production that, that allows you to to handle those in a appropriate fashion. Yeah. So when you guys come on site, are you actually having like a huddle up where you're establishing that hierarchy and that clarity Absolutely. of role? Yeah. Oh, that's impressive. I like that. I like that. I don't know if I've ever been like a fly on the wall for that. <laughs> but maybe I should maybe I should try to be next Yeah, time. I mean when it's you know our, our core team, everyone we've been working together so well and so in this yeah, you're just like, I smooth, see you. when you have it. <laughs> you know, 50 person union crew, then it's, it's added importance in that regard. But. Do you have like, sometimes have to have sidebar conversations with your, your TD about like the, the crew that you're just getting introduced to for the first time. Like I see that guy's strong. I see this person's a little, we're going to have to keep our eyes on that person. We might have to help them out. Yeah. There's this evaluation that goes along with it. And, uh, if it, if it is a union crew, it's, it's communicating that with the steward and keeping an eye on it as it as it progresses um rather than it coming to a head at a later point um i think in my mind more information is the better uh rather than keeping people in the dark i'm like this is 
this is what we, we we have to accomplish. This is the time we have. This is where I want to be at the end of the day. And, you know, trying to communicate that with all those involved um, rather than everyone just kind of working in the dark towards an unforeseen goal. I, my personal approach is to provide people with as much information to, you know, make it a successful event and have them be successful. I was like naming the hard truth sometimes too. Like, right. these are our limitations. Mm-hmm. This is the concern I have. Let's name it now and not like as something, as, you know, the fire builds. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you're like, I knew that guy was going to be a problem, but I didn't say anything about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Are there, um, are there folks that, um, or work out there in the world that you like really admire and, um, or like a, you know, I don't know, a pinnacle project you wish you could get your hands on. <laughs> Cause we have some of those, like, um, I want to work with this company or I'll be so happy when I have a project that looks like this. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah, there's no individuals per se, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll look at, uh, the production or stage or budget behind some major, uh, you know, musical act or a, a music festival or something. And it's just like, oh, that, you know, that, that, <laughs> like, oh, if we had that budget and, you know, that scale, um, that, 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 that I find appealing. But yeah. Like, would you like to, to be level. producing? Would you like to be producing music festivals and things at that scale? Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Very cool. Because sometimes I look at things and I think, oh, I envy that. And then I have to remind myself, but I don't want to be doing that work. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> not where I'm going. But but music festivals, I mean, that sounds very much like yeah, uh, doable. And it's, you know, and then tracing it all the way back to just throwing a good party in, in essence, you know, whether it's a corporate stage, it's just having the attendees have a, a good experience and it's memorable. Um but in terms of a music festival, it's that, you know, the lighting and the, the effects and the, the sound and everything, you know, that, that I, I enjoy as well. And that all loops back to your high school DJ gig. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I know that it. works. Uh-huh. Is there anything I didn't ask you about yourself for EPMC that we should cover? Um, we are ready and available. Uh, work with you on your upcoming events. And we yeah. travel. Well, but, yeah. Well, I know our project teams always have an amazing experience with your, you and yours. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, we trust EPMC with our, our VIP clients and always get the best. Um, so thanks. Thanks for being a good partner and collaborator with us. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure working with Kennedy events for yeah. a few um, years now. Yeah. Well, so I've been talking with. David Ferris, head of live events at EPMC. You can learn more about EPMC at epmcpro.com. Uh, and I bet we can find you on LinkedIn. David, any other social media handles you want folks to have? Um, no, LinkedIn would probably be best. Very good. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Paige. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Events Podcast. Come back next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.